politicians are proud of the democratic progress they've made since the fall of former dictator Sohato almost 14 years ago. But many are frustrated with the nation's judicial system, saying it is archaic and riddled with corruption. Judges and police are accused of favoring the wealthy and influential while targeting the poor and powerless. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. This edition of 101 East examines Indonesia's justice system and asks if the punishment fits the crime. Indonesia loves its national heroes. The capital Jakarta is dotted with statues honoring men and women who have fought for justice and helped shape the nation. Today, an unlikely hero has emerged. Anja Lagaronda is a high school student in Palu, a remote town in central Sulawesi. Like many raucous teenagers, Anja and his friends have been known to get up to mischief. But in Indonesia, childish pranks can lead to serious consequences. In January this year, Anja faced a district court after a policeman accused him of stealing his sandals. The case was undermined when it emerged Anja had been beaten by his accuser and his colleagues. Still, the 15-year-old was convicted of theft and faced five years in prison for the petty crime. The public protested what seemed an unfair trial by dumping thousands of sandals outside the court. The judge then released Anja back to his parents' care. Anja says the experience still haunts him. They beat me here on my back with a piece of wood. They kicked me, they punched me in the stomach, then they slapped me. They beat me on my shoulders. Then they pushed me into the gutter and warned me not to tell anyone about the beating. Anjar's mother filed a report regarding the attack. My mom made the police report in the morning. Then in the afternoon, the policeman came to my house and threatened my mother. He said if she didn't withdraw the report, he would take me to the regional police office and report me for stealing his sandals. He came three times with the same threat, but my mother refused, and that's why I ended up in court. The policeman has since been demoted and relocated to a different town, but Anja remains with a criminal record for a crime he says he didn't commit. I feel I have been unfairly treated. Just because they are police officers, they think they can get away with doing anything to the common people. They treat us unfairly. Anjar's lawyer, Elvis Katuwu, says the public's reaction to the case shows the growing frustration Indonesians feel towards the nation's judicial system. He says there is a general perception that the judiciary doesn't protect those who are helpless and instead is biased towards the wealthy and influential. In my opinion, this anger has been growing from recent cases like when an old lady was convicted for stealing two cocoa beans or the domestic maid who was charged for bringing home two of her employer's broken plates or someone who stole one dollar from their employer. These were all brought to court and charged. But at the same time, there are so many bigger cases like corruption or murder involving rich people that are swept under the carpet. Why go after the small fish and let the big fish get away? The justice system in Indonesia is still far away from being fair. There is so much corruption. It's money and political powers that control the justice in Indonesia. And this is what money can buy in Jakarta's courts. I could drive 250 kilometers an hour in the toll road, you know. Hotman Paris Hutapea is one of the country's top litigation lawyers, and he's not shy about reveling in his success. With 20 years' experience, he is a favorite amongst the wealthy who find themselves in trouble with the law. Today, he is defending Mohammed Nazaruddin, a former treasurer of President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono's Democratic Party. 
Nazaruddin is accused of embezzling millions of dollars set aside for last year's Southeast Asian Games, but claims his innocence. The case is yet another in a series of corruption trials against the country's politicians, but there have been very few convictions. What happened at the beginning is... Back in his office, Hotman spoke about the many high-profile cases he's won. When I asked if he'd ever bribed a judge to rule in his favor, he insisted on saying off-camera that he only ever acted in his clients' and the judges' interests. But he admits justice can be bought in Indonesia and that there is widespread bribery and corruption in the judicial system. He says it's because the country's judges and police are poorly paid. You cannot ask somebody to do the work if he's hungry. That's the philosophy. You cannot ask somebody to do the work if he's thinking, hey, my son go to the school, to the university. I have to pay the school fee. You cannot expect them. You cannot expect the, the person like them to issue a justice if he's, he cannot even concentrate because of pro uh, economic problem. Hotman did admit that a higher salary would not necessarily root out corruption because the practice had become an accepted part of Indonesian culture. Hotman says many people believe that with wealth comes status and honor. For example, when I was in the small region in North Sumatra, still young, if I see a high official come from Jakarta to visit his homeland, if he's poor, nobody respect him. Okay? But if he's wealthy, if even people know that it's not honestly because the salary, everybody know that the salary of public official, you know, but people respect him. I asked if judges provided immunity for the rich and influential suspects. Uh, not necessarily immunity, but at least to avoid to some extent. It's not really immunity. So it's too extreme if you say immunity, but he... He tried to uh, avoid that or at least to reduce the liability. Activists say that trials involving high-profile, wealthy or influential suspects rarely end with a conviction. This, they say, is because money talks louder than justice. Justice can be bought here in Indonesia. We have a term that, is, that we call mafia pengadilan. Uh, the judiciary mafia. There are always intermediaries to bribe judges, to bribe prosecutors, and they also ask for that. So if you have the money, you can buy justice. Andreas Harsono from Human Rights Watch also says the reluctance to convict the elite is because of a close network that protect each other. Since 1959, President Sukarno created what he called Muspida, the Consultative Assembly Forum for judges, uh, government officials, bupati, mayors, prosecutors, military commanders, police officers, uh, that they are usually having regular meetings, monthly or bi-monthly meetings, to coordinate uh, things, political affairs, social affairs, in their respective portfolio. And this makes the judiciary is not independent. We met with Indonesia's Attorney General Basrif Arif and asked whether there was any truth to the perception that the nation's judicial system was not independent and could be bought. Saya kira apa yang di statement yang seperti itu I think that statement is not true at all. Our prosecutors and law enforcement agencies are regulated and completely independent. We've spoken to several lawyers, though, and several people who actually work within the legal system, and they tell us that yes, because they work within the legal system, they've been known to work the system itself, they know that the system can be, can be influenced, that the system can be bought if you have enough money. And these are lawyers who tell us this. Uh, I don't deny that some people perceive justice can be bought. Maybe some people have had that kind of experience with one or two individuals from the judiciary. But overall, I don't think that is the case. I don't deny that there have been prosecutors who have disgraced the system, but they have been found out and dealt with. We have an ongoing bureaucratic reform program, and I'm sure that one day everything can be called clean and clear.
We are doing our best to get to that stage so that such a negative opinion of our judiciary no longer exists. It's been said that there's a judicial mafia in existence yeah. here. In What are you doing about it? Yes, there is such a thing in Indonesia as the judiciary mafia. We are well aware of it, but we are slowly rooting out this practice. It will take time, as the practice has been in place for a long time. In my opinion, the quote-unquote judiciary mafia includes everyone from the investigator, the prosecutor, the court and the judge. Even the lawyers are involved. But each unit is working to eradicate this practice and to clean up the system. Those at the top need to set the example. It will take time, but we are progressing slowly. Earlier this year, the Indonesian public came out in support of a 15-year-old boy who allegedly stole some sandals from a policeman. Why do you think that case galvanized all of Indonesia? People tend to think that a sword of justice is sharp to the bottom, but dull to the top. It's just a perception. As the Attorney General, I can assure you that that is not the reality. We must use the law to protect the people, not to punish them for no real reason. This is especially so with cases involving children who have committed crimes. There are regulations that ensure that they are protected and they can be made a ward of the state or returned to the care of their parents. Indonesia is reviewing its juvenile justice system. Current legislation allows children as young as eight to be tried, convicted and jailed. There are moves to raise the age of conviction to 12 and to provide rehabilitation programs. Most juveniles are put into detention centers, but there have been reports of children sharing cells with adult prisoners because of Indonesia's overcrowded jails. 12-year-old Darpin considers himself fortunate to have been sent to Tangerang Detention Center in Jakarta. In the adult prison, you will be beaten regularly, but here, it's quiet and peaceful. If we have problems, we can always talk about it to our guards. There is no beating here. Darpin entered Tangerang when he was 10, after he and a friend were convicted of harassing a girl. Darpin claims he is innocent and was initially cleared of the charges. But when the victim's family appealed, Darpin says the police took him from his home without parental consent and made him a ward of the state. He will only be released when he turns 18. The first time I came in here, I was afraid and confused. The prosecutors had lied to me. They said I was being enrolled in an Islamic boarding school. But when I got here, I asked the other kids if this was a boarding school. They said, no, it's prison. I was so confused and scared. Every night I cried because I didn't know why they put me here. I thought I would go mad. My mom visits me quite often here, now like once a month. She always asks me, Dapin, what have they done to you? Are they beating you? I will always tell her, no mom, I'm fine here. I don't want her to worry. Darpin says life in the detention center is not so bad as he is able to attend school, keep up with religious studies, learn a trade and play with friends. But he says there is no substitute for freedom. Every night I ask God, why am I still here when I am not guilty? Why are the police so mean to me? Why have I been taken away from my parents? 
kepada bapa, mama. I want to apologize to my parents, my father, my mother, for me being in here. I am sorry if I ever hurt them in the past. If I get out, I will follow rules. I have learned my lesson. Maafin saya. Di sini dah sehat-sehat saya di sini. Dapin's story highlights an ongoing national debate on whether judicial punishments fit the crime. Activists say there is no better example than the sentences meted out to perpetrators of violence against minority religious groups. In February last year, a mob of 1,500 people attacked an Ahmadiyya mosque in central Sulawesi, killing three Ahmadis. The ensuing trial resulted in three suspects being convicted and sentenced to three to six months in prison. Human rights groups say the case is an example of how Islamic fundamentalists have influenced the judiciary. We asked the Attorney General why the sentences were so light, given three deaths had occurred. I don't think the sentences were unfair. We need to look at the conditions on the ground. Sometimes, if we come down too hard, then that may cause a bigger riot. How will that benefit anyone? We need to take into consideration the local sensitivities of the area. Is there a reluctance to prosecute people who carry out violence in the name of Islam? Saya tidak akan masuk ke ruang masalahkan agama ini karena sepengetahuan I am not going to go into this religion topic. As far as I know, as a Muslim, Islam does not teach you violence. It does not teach you to be anarchists. Rahmatan lil alamin. Rahmatan lil alamin. Grace for all. That means to give goodness. I will not go into the topic of religion because it is not my area. So in this way you're saying that Indonesia's judicial system is not influenced by the Ministry of Religion or politicians? <laughs> no. No, no. While the nation debates the fairness of Indonesia's judiciary, there is agreement here on one sentence, capital punishment. Polls regularly show widespread support for the death penalty for terrorists and drug dealers. The last execution in Indonesia took place in 2008 when the three Bali bombers faced the firing squad. According to the Justice and Human Rights Ministry, there are currently 113 people on death row. 58 of them charged with drug trafficking. The narcotics law is very hard on dealers, importers or producers of drugs. Anyone caught with more than five grams of all narcotics types are threatened with the death sentence. But those who are proven to be users are obligated to go through with medical or social rehabilitation. This is because we consider the abusers as victims of the drug trade. They are sick people who need rehabilitation and they need to be healed. But producers and traffickers of the drugs are the ones who will destroy this nation. Several of the inmates have been on death row for over 10 years. The current system allows innumerable appeals to be made, thereby delaying their execution. But the Anti-Narcotics Board is pushing to change the system to only allow one appeal, followed by a quick execution. If they are not executed soon after they have been sentenced to death, it gives them a chance to continue the drug trade from inside the prisons. After all, they have nothing to lose on death row. They want to earn some money, so they deal drugs from the inside. This creates more problems for us. 
I asked if Indonesia will ever abolish the death penalty. Indonesia masih membutuhkan hukuman mati dikarenakan Indonesia still needs to implement the death sentence because, as we all know, narcotics are a terrible crime. Why? Because every year there are about 15,000 Indonesians who die from drug abuse. There are 3.8 million drug users in Indonesia. If we don't implement the death sentence, then we will lose a lot of young Indonesians whom we call the lost generation. Indonesia's draconian approach to drug trafficking can be seen in Jakarta's Cipinang prison, which mostly holds drug dealers and users. This jail is meant to house 1,800 prisoners, but currently hold 2,500. Most drug traffickers here are Indonesians, but the country's drug trade only makes headlines when foreigners are involved. Michael Blanc was charged with trafficking four kilograms of hashish into Bali in 2000. As a drug user, he escaped the death sentence and was instead given life in prison. He is now up for eight years parole to be served in Indonesia, where he will have to report daily to a local police station. I didn't know this place after death sentence. I will never come here <laughs> if I knew. I told my sentence uh, would be uh, pretty light, you know. Uh, so I was not thinking too much about it. And when I get sentenced, it's a different story. Isn't it? <laughs> what was that like to learn that you got life imprisonment? Uh, shock, shocking, very shocking. You've gone through the Indonesian judicial system. Mm -hmm. How has it treated you? Do you think it's been fair? I don't think it's fair. In what way? Uh, legal way. Legal way. In what way? <laughs> okay, I understand. I understand you're up for parole and you don't want to ruin your chances. Exactly. The lawyers that whom you appointed, mm -hmm. do you think they did the best that they could to help you with your sentence? They did nothing. Nothing. I don't know. They didn't help you? No. They put me down more than what they helped me. While Michael ponders an uncertain future, the rest of Indonesia contemplates an uncertain judicial system. As long as judges and police can be bought and harsh punishments are imposed for petty crimes, Indonesia has a long way to go before justice can truly be served. Next week, 101 East is in the Maldives where a dramatic leadership change has just taken place. The nation's first democratically elected president has been replaced as protests continue on the streets. This is a coup. Do I look like somebody who will bring about a coup d'etat? 101 East speaks to newly sworn in President Mohammad Wahid about the future of this island paradise.